Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Extend Your Identity Investment, Establish Governance and Control for Privileged Access. I'm Shay Mann, and I will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is in listen-only mode, so if you have any questions throughout the event, go ahead and submit those in the Q&A panel, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded, and we will email you a link to the recorded version tomorrow. Joining us today is SailPoint's Vice President of Corporate Development, Joe Gottlieb. In addition, we have Frank Bagulio joining us, an SE here at SailPoint, to give us a brief demo at the end of the presentation. And with that, Joe, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you to get us started. Thanks, Shay, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. This topic has been very active in our customer base and across the industry, mostly because the concept of governing privileged accounts has become extremely important to reducing the risk of data breaches and attacks that are out there assaulting our infrastructure and our networks. And so today what we want to share is what the state of the art is really in bringing these two worlds together, this world of identity governance administration and privileged account management, and how you can do that with an offering that we have that we've recently released that we've referred to as the Privileged Account Management Module, which is an extension of our identity governance and administration offering, Identity IQ. Today's presentation will follow through this basic structure. I want to start out with a little bit of industry and market perspective. What's the context for this, uh, this discussion? And then I want to talk about the individual solutions, you know, how they differ, how they are similar, what the overlap is between IGA and PAM. And then we'll talk through how they can be made much better together by integrating these two solutions together using not only the the partnerships that we've made with the PAM solution vendors, but also the PAM module that we've recently rolled out, which of course then Frank Bagulio will demonstrate for us at the end of the presentation, and then we'll take some questions. So to start out with industry perspective, I like to think of this as really a collision of two urgencies. We have the urgency upon us that is all about locking down privileged access, and we'll talk a bit about why this is so important, but in a nutshell, we have to lock down these privileged accounts because they present the most leverage to the attackers that are looking to get, our, to get to our data, to get to our infrastructure. Meanwhile, we all know because of our work in identity governance and, and administration that we have to make sure we establish control over who has access to what. And any large enterprise that is not doing that today is leaving open a lot of attack surface area because of entitlement creep and other accounts that could now be utilized or uh, either, either legitimately through abuse or um, through being stolen and, and abused by attackers that are coming in. So both of these, these efforts are really critically important to securing the enterprise, and we now have them coming together to have to, to, to have force us to look at how do we bring these two solutions, how do we bring these two processes together to be more effective. Meanwhile, the audit frontier continues to advance, and what used to be the basic questions of, you know, when did you last certify all access, uh, the question increasingly is, when did you last certify your privileged accounts? And so this clearly draws out the need to be able to include the privileged account domain or scope within the ongoing effort that we have in governance so that we're recertifying access at the right frequency for these privileged accounts, which can be so useful in the hands of the bad folks uh, that we're defending against. And then last but not least, when we think about perspective, this is an opportunity to collaborate between the governance team and the security team. In fact, it, you could argue it is the most pressing and most urgent opportunity to collaborate within a broader sphere of opportunities uh, where we're taking identity governance and our investment therein and making it work harder for our company by making it a more relevant ingredient in the security infrastructure, the security policy base, the security operations. As you might have seen, we've also touched on other topics like how we're partnering with SIEM and UEBA vendors to make sure that we can do more automated response and improved identity context analysis of security analytics, which are critical to the security operations of an enterprise. Anyway, the point being here is that we have, a, I think, an increasing and opening opportunity to collaborate across the organization to help our, our enterprise be more effective against diminishing the, rich, the risk of data breaches. So a couple data points to just underscore uh, the point. 
Um, Forrester points out that 80% of security breaches involve privileged credentials. In fact, I've seen uh, statements from folks like Mandiant uh, where this could be as high as 100%, depending upon who you ask and whose opinion you, you consider. In our market poll survey, we've identified that 67% of enterprises surveyed cannot produce a report showing who has access to what within 24 hours. So these these data points kind of underscore, not so much for this group, but for the broad market, uh, a bit of exposure in terms of the role of privileged accounts and breaches, as well as the need to really establish governance and control. So those two urgencies that are colliding. This picture puts it all in perspective, right? This is the attack life cycle. And I put up this picture because I think, you know, everyone would agree in the security world today that this is the primary attack cycle that we're defending against. So whether the threat's coming from internal or external, right, the attacker is looking to establish control over a particular part of the infrastructure and is looking for advanced privileges. And if they don't find them on any one machine or any, any one account or application, they move laterally to escalate privileges, potentially to servers and or domain controllers to get into very, very privileged access. And once they've establish that access, and this could take some time, it could take a, lot, uh, a, a, a great deal of patience, although the pace continues to accelerate, they start to exfiltrate data. And so this is the cycle that you know, you'll see any security vendor put up. It's, it's the cycle they have to offer up their solution value to help mitigate this particular sequence that's being, that's being executed by attackers. And another way of looking at this is by looking at the, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, or the state of the breach art, as I like to call it. Uh, these different uh, graphs show that this typical life cycle of attack is what is really upon us, even as we analyze the breaches that have already happened. So on the far left there, the threat actor categories, mostly external. These are external folks trying to exfiltrate data from your company. Sometimes they involve internal threats as well. Sometimes it's true fraud where it's pure internal and you've got folks that are harvesting data internally and maybe selling it on the open market, right? Regardless, you can see the threat actor motivation, right? Mostly financial, but also an increased incidence of espionage. That would be, you know, theft of trade secrets and uh, things like that. Uh, ransomware is, is somewhere in between, right? You could, you could, you know, you could attack folks and machines and get a hold of their property and lock it up so that they can't access it again uh, unless they provide some financial remuneration in exchange. So ransomware is a little bit of a straddling effect. But you can see that these threat actor motives are clearly driving the bulk of the breaches that, that are being analyzed today. FIG is, a, is an interesting category. That stands for fun, um, ideology and grudge. And so you may recall the, uh, the trend of, of hacktivism that was occurring. That's kind of died out when we look at the, the DBIR data. Um, financial and espionage continue to be the, the key drivers for the bulk of the attacks, which helps put things in perspective, right? They're going after the data and exfiltrating it because it has a value. And then the threat action categories, hacking, malware, and social, that, that really helps describe the way that these attacks are being carried out. And so much like we showed in that attack lifecycle picture, most of these attacks involve um, manual and or semi-automated hacking, at least in part. There are also automated aspects of this that tend to involve malware, where malware agents are being used to advance various steps in that sequence that we showed before. And of course, social, we know is a critical, critical entree point um, to uh, the attack cycle because it's often the way that we get that first connection to the first endpoint that we can attack. So a phishing attack, typically a spear phishing attack, is put forth via email, and you get a user to click on a link because you've impersonated uh, one of their colleagues or you've presented them with an offer that you think will catch their attention. Net, net, that's, they only need you to click one time on one thing, and they start that whole sequence. We're now under the radar. Uh, they're able to start uh, moving laterally and escalating privileges. I share all that background, and I think most of it should probably be pretty familiar to you because it, it sets up the fact that between identity governance and administration and privileged access security or privileged access management, we have two of the pivotal parts of our security and operations infrastructure that we have to continue to advance into the best practices to be able to minimize the threat of these attacks. 
So let's now dive into these two solutions and look at what, what really is delivered by IGA, what's delivered by privileged account management. And as I like to say, both of these functions or both of these solutions are needed. And uh, you'll obviously, the, the, the payoff um, of, of that punchline is, but they're of course better together. But right now we're seeing these things as being somewhat separate in many deployments. So on the IGA side, what you're getting is broad governance for all accounts, the ability to discover accounts, the ability to provision accounts or deprovision accounts according to a life cycle. You, of course, run your access certification campaigns where you're able to recertify access at the appropriate frequency uh, depending upon your policies and depending upon the sensitivity of certain accounts, certain applications, certain access. And then, of course, you have your access request, which starts it all up. So an IGA solution, as you guys well know, is all about having a strong business interface and policy base and a workflow and, a, and a, wherever possible a large amount of automation to ensure that we're establishing broad governance for all accounts. Meanwhile, on the privileged account management side, we're doing some different things. Yes, you've got some ability to discover accounts and, and you've got the ability to provision privileged access, but you're also delivering some other very, very important and very deep controls on the privileged accounts. You're doing credential lockdown, credential vaulting, credential rotation in the case of shared accounts. You are controlling those accounts and who has access to them, typically via groups, but also in some cases via direct assignment. You are controlling the session in many cases, uh, whereby you can actually intervene if you have a reason to intervene. Um, and some of that is now increasingly being driven by some of these same security operations and analytics like the SIEM and UEBA tools. And so we'll eventually talk about how um, the privileged account management solutions are also trying to respond to known suspicious activities via their account and session control that they have uh, with these deep controls. And last but not least, the privileged account management systems, uh, the best among them, are doing session monitoring. Uh, video recording and ongoing monitoring. You can look at these things real time. You can start to tag particular things in videos that you want to be looking for. For example, uh, two different screens from two different types of systems that, are, that tend to only show up in a hacking sequence. And so this is the state of the art. So we're starting to get a better ability to be monitoring these sessions, in some cases in real time. In other cases, you know, more typically, you're able to go back to the video recording as, a, as an important point of forensic analysis to see, oh, what actually happened when these events were kicking off in my SIEM or UEBA system? Let me go back and look. And so these are deep controls that we apply to these privileged accounts. You wouldn't apply these controls necessarily to all accounts although someday we may become that thorough. Today, we are administering these deep controls on a targeted basis on the most precious and powerful accounts. Unfortunately, as we've said, these solutions are operating independently today. And uh, that sets up uh, a situation which even Gartner has called out as being problematic. Here you've got Jane, the IT engineer. Uh, she has standard privileges that are provided by in this case, an isolated IGA system. Uh, those include her access to the directory, her email accounts, and her standard business applications. Because of her role, she also, as an IT engineer, needs access to these web servers, a database, and also some cloud and data center facilities and some, some shared accounts on those. And that's because she's got an advanced role in engineering and she needs to be able to access those things. But unfortunately, in a situation where these two systems are not integrated, um, these privileges are completely isolated, and there's no ability to have centralized visibility or centralized control over the situation. And so the result is, and I would call these items out as good drivers or rationale for a project that you want to move forward in bringing together IGA and PAM. Um, you've got situations like an increase in dormant or orphaned privileged accounts. Those are the unused accounts that are lying around and they present an increase in the attack surface area for the bad guys. Remember, if we go back to that attack lifecycle diagram, they're literally, in some cases, by trial and error, probing, groping the attack surface to see what they can find. And the more orphaned and unused accounts you have lying around, the greater likelihood that they're going to encounter something in their canvassing, in their searching, in their crawling uh, to be able to utilize against you. Privileged entitlement creep is a familiar 
topic that we we know of in our our you know we we think of entitlement creep in the in the standard sense. It certainly happens in the privilege sense as well. So if a if Jane the IT engineer right changes roles and she gets into the development organization, but she holds on to her privileged account access that she had as an engineer and now inherits new access to do her development tasks. We now have privilege entitlement creep. Again, that increases the surface area for the attack uh, because now we've got you know probably unused accounts that Jane is no longer using, or potentially if someone hacks into Jane's identity, right, they can now have access to some things that you know we didn't want the bad guys to have access to. There's a greater point of leverage in just getting a hold of Jane's access because of the privilege entitlement creep. We also have some other you know, implications here of, of two disparate IGA and PAM systems. Um, you can have erroneous provisioning of privileged access. For example, in the case where you don't have your segregation of duties policies imposed upon the new provisioning of privileged access, uh, that can lead to erroneous, uh, erroneous scenarios. And then meanwhile, um, without these systems coming together, you certainly lack centralized visibility auditing and reporting. And this is clearly an obstacle to the primary mission of identity governance administration, that ability to look at everything across the board, both for an individual user, as well as the entire company, as well as the entire company's um, work with contractors, if that's part of your scope, et cetera. And then last but not least, um, this is more of an empowerment velocity implication, if you don't have the privileged account management system as part of your lifecycle management, you can't automate the, the, the provisioning of privileged account access uh, for your new users that need it to do their jobs. And right, so there's, a, there's now a, there's even a, a, there's an empowerment velocity implication of not having these systems tied together. And so clearly, we can address these things by pulling these two systems together. And so here's that picture now where you can take the broad governance for all accounts and bring it together with the deep controls for privileged accounts. And in fact, we've already been at work doing this with a broad variety of privileged account management vendors. You can see them here. And we're in fact still adding more players in the market are joining our Identity Plus Alliance program. And we've already certified in five cases the solutions of these partners utilizing what we've had to date, which is uh, an STI interface, the simple table integration interface that we exposed as part of our SDK in our ecosystem for these partners to integrate their solutions with SailPoint Identity IQ. And so that's what's enabled us to have this bidirectional data flow with these companies so that we can impose this broad governance across all accounts, including the privileged accounts, and therefore preserve the deep controls that are active on those accounts, but still have the, 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 the enterprise horizontal policies that SailPoint IGA is, is imposing across the board. Now, if you look at how we've evolved um, to this point, right, we started out before this point having a very manual bulk importer. So we could, uh, we could import privileged accounts on a, on, a, on a bulk basis from time to time and do some analysis and do some reporting on what we could see you know, via some connectors to the privileged account management solutions. With the Identity Plus Alliance and the opening of Identity IQ, utilizing the STI interface that I mentioned a moment ago, we've been able to create um, these bidirectional flows of data, pulling the accounts in, and in fact having individual ability to certify those accounts for an individual, as well as um, actually handle access requests and, uh, and also provisioning. To these, to these particular safes. With the advent and launch of the PAM module, we've really up-leveled this capability, and that's what I'll talk about a bit more today, and, and Frank will demonstrate for you at the end of this session. So we've really now created a richer interface uh, for our, our partners, as well as enabled in Identity IQ an extension of the UI to handle uh, these privileges and the way we need to be looking at them, which is a little bit different than we've looked at privileges in the past. And then we expect over time our partners will continue to, to extend their integrations utilizing these more rich features that we've delivered in the PAM module um, as, we, as we iterate with those partners uh, over time. If I look at these blue and purple stripes here, the ultimate result is that we've been able to present richer product capabilities right out of the box 
and we've been able to advance the value of the solution more quickly with a simpler approach to how to implement as well as you know, remove the manual processes that you might have to have uh, complementing what can be done in an automated form. So let's now take a look at this privileged account management module and, uh, and, and poke and, and prod it a little bit to see what it can do for us. So at the highest level, it really unifies lifecycle management and the ap application of these consistent controls uh, over onto the privileged accounts, right? And so we had some of this before with the bidirectional flow uh, coming to and from the, the privileged account management vendors. But as you'll see, as we click down into this, you'll see that we've really enriched the way that Identity IQ can handle this information. Um, of course, you wind up with a very, very powerful capability here now to have centralized administration, uh, both the privileged access and as w through these established policies, right? So really, really critical things to be able to bring together at the highest level. And how do we do that? So here's where things start to get a little bit different with the PAM module. This is the logical integration architecture. And as you can see on the far right there, any of these PAM solutions, they have containers. Uh, some of them call them vaults, some call them safes. And within each container that's really focused on a particular set of things, right, you have users that are assigned access to those containers, uh, oftentimes through groups, but you can have direct access. And the container also specifies what sort of access control lists apply to the permissions and the privileged data that are in those containers. And so with this construct, you can now have a complete holistic system uh, for what kind of privileged access you want to enable. Some users might have basic access even to the privileged accounts. Maybe they have read-only. Some users may have more advanced access. They can even administer the privileged uh, container right, by adding users uh, as an example. And so you could have this now, the typical privileged account management system has a variety of containers that really represent the constructs or the sort of the units of work or the units of access that uh, have been deemed appropriate in the way that these things can be administered. And of course, what the PRAM solution is providing, as I've said before, is they're doing the credential vaulting, they're doing the session recording on all of those accounts that are in those containers. Now, over on the Identity IQ side, you can see now via the PAM module, we are replicating this view of those PAM containers and all the things that they contain so that we can provide the visibility, the provisioning and the deprovisioning and the certification and audit of these privileged accounts and the specific permissions that lie in the containers for the users that Identity IQ is governing. You'll also see here a reference to SKIM the system for cross-domain identity management. This is a really important standard that SailPoint and many others in the identity industry are pushing forward. And really what it does is it, it just enables a very standardized but rich way to share identity information between two different systems. And so now that we're utilizing SKIM, uh, we've actually taken the opportunity to provide a richer data flow than we even had before. Before we were doing um, some basic SQL uh, data flow between two different systems. Now with using SKIM, we're actually providing a richer level of, uh, in the hierarchy between the container itself and the permission within the container. And so what you'll see um, in some of these use cases, you'll see that richness start to show up in the way that we can um, provide uh, a greater level of visibility and a greater level of control across these two different systems. So if we start to look at these individual use cases, and these are, are things that Frank will be able to show in the demo, uh, first and foremost, we think about centralized visibility. Um, and the, the real payoff here is, is gaining complete visibility to all user access, right, including the privileged accounts. Now, we had that before, but with the enhanced uh, data interface that we have with the PAM module, we're going to have more information about the, the way that the, the user got that information, the way that the user got that access vis-a-vis -vis the containers and the specific permissions within those containers. So the PAM module will enhance what we've already had in terms of the centralized visibility, but you have to bring these two systems together to get that. Otherwise, as we've said, one of the primary missions of identity governance administration is impeded, and that is this complete visibility in that identity cube that we, that we manage. 
You can also aggregate the, the container and the, and the safe contents beyond the account. So here's another area where that extension is, is manifest, right? So now we can see not just individual accounts. In the first approach, we really flattened all the entitlements and you saw them on an elemental level. Now you can see them um, as, they, as they show up uh, as peers within containers that then users have access to. And so the last point really underscores one of the things I love about this new PAM module, and that is you can take a look at the containers themselves, and within each container, you can see the individual users that have access to that container. You can see what they can do, right, in terms of the actual permissions they have inside the container, and you can see how they receive that access, either via direct assignment or via a group that they're a member of. And this allows a very, very powerful ability now to zoom in and say, aha, I can now see how this particular user is gaining that particular access or that combination of access. Maybe that gives me a reason to rethink my group structure. Maybe that gives me a reason to sort of divide it into more um, a, a lower segmentation that might already be uh, being administered via the privileged account management system. And so as we, as we mix these systems and get this visibility, we're going to be able to refine the types of policies and the types of control points, and, and in, in many cases the granularity that we need to perform. Maybe in other cases we'll see, it, we'll see an opportunity to simplify, and we'll say, you know what, we can zoom back out. The, the risk level does not change much between this level of granularity and that level of granularity. We might even be able to see opportunities to simplify. But that's the point of governance, right? The ability to establish the right level of control to minimize risk for access. So moving along to lifecycle management, this is another uh, you know, set of great benefits that we can trigger in a familiar domain, right? We can eliminate waiting time for privileged access. That's this whole concept of synchronizing lifecycle events. And whether it's you know, joiner, mover, or lever, we can make sure that the privileged account access is pacing with the lifecycle triggers and the automation and workflow and approval structures that we have in SailPoint Identity IQ. So super pow powerful concept. Of course, with that, we can mitigate entitlement creep that we talked about before as a really negative um, byproduct of these systems operating independently. We can eliminate the orphaned accounts, right, via timely provisioning and maybe to more to the point, deprovisioning. And of course, we can reduce another, another uh, added benefit is we can reduce error prone fulfillment with automated provisioning. So imagine that, right? If you, if you think about it, as we automate more and more provisioning across the life cycle and we get it right and we see that those rules are working well, then we've eliminated some human error opportunities in the, in the life cycle. And on an ongoing basis, that's one of the benefits we look for in, uh, in identity governance, right? Automate things that we understand really well, therefore take out both the delay and the potential for error. Shifting over to policy management, again, these will be a, it'll be a familiar concept. We're all familiar with the way that we can use separation of duty policies to control who has access to what and make sure we don't have toxic combinations. Well, the same is true, and you could argue the stakes are even higher in the privileged account world, right? In this case, we're looking at, you know, maybe we don't want to have um, an Oracle DBA able to access Oracle financials. We all know that would be bad, right? Because you could start doing some pretty nifty fraudulent things in the financial world if you could be covering your tracks in the database via some DBA credentials that you have. And so all the SOD policies and controls that we normally think of, they just get turned up on steroids when you think about how they can be applied to the privileged account domain. Um, and so that's true both at the elemental level, like any individual policy that we want to impose, any individual toxic combination, but then as we zoom out, right, the whole complete governance footprint becomes more effective and appropriate and efficient if we have this sort of centralized policy administration of these SOD policies, we have a method for establishing them and checking them and refining them, and we're now sure that it's being applied to all the privileged account domains. Now, one thing I'll mention is, you know, large enterprises through M&A and a variety of other activities, they can often wind up with multiple PAM systems. So here's a scenario where having multiple PAM systems be integrated with 
your IgA system becomes very important because now you want to you want to make sure you don't have again silos or fiefdoms, particularly for SOD type uh, policies that you want to impose uh, that might occur if you've got uh, different PAM solutions. In we step over into access certification. Once again, we apply the same concepts that were are quite familiar to us in the in the, the standard IGA world, and they certainly apply to the privileged account management uh, world. And so, being able to take, like we said, so so for an individual user, when we think about certifying individual users and their access, we certainly want, if let's say we have a supervisor-oriented campaign, we certainly want the supervisor looking at that user's standard and privileged accounts, because that's the whole point. And the key here, as we know, is we want to be mindful of certification exhaustion. We want to hit that balance point between what's appropriate certification frequency, depending upon the access, and what's going to be too much, which might cause the exhaustion that can lead to either rubber stamping or, you know, just inattention. And so, making sure that we're we're going ahead and now looking at both standard access as well as privileged access in the same certification, we can become more efficient with our certification campaigns. Of course, we can also now certify that the users have the right access and the right safes, and that's a particular development that uh, is enabled by the PAM module. Um, and what's coming soon in the world of, uh, of certification is actually certifying the composition of the PAM containers and safes. And so right now that's something that we we ingest from the PAM solutions um, and we don't have an active certification control over over how those containers are actually composed. We can certify the contents as they roll through into the end users and a, a future capability will be to literally use now certification to govern the administration of those safes and containers themselves. We won't stop here. I've, I've alluded to at least one future use case that we'll be able to address. There are other things we're looking at as well. Um, and as you know, this is this is all stuff is subject to change. But things that we're investigating including, include um, the first one is actually taking the PAM system and aiming it right back at Identity IQ, and that is making sure that Identity IQ credentials are actually stored and rotated and controlled by a PAM solution outboard of Identity IQ. So many of you have come to us and said, you know, you've got a PAM system and it's out there managing all those privileged credentials, and you'd like to make sure that it has control over the credentials that Identity IQ uses to get into target systems. And so that's a future item under development. We then are also looking at how to add the ability to request access to PAM containers and safes that's not presently supported by the PAM module um, and its implementation. We actually have that with the STI-based integrations, but that's with that sort of lower-level entitlement um, approach to the data. And so there's a little bit of feature overlap there that we want to clean up in a future capability. And then um, last but not least, SOD policy checking um, for uh, – that's where before you add something in the privileged account management, this would be a preventative control, right, where you, you add – uh, add a user via the privileged account management system, uh, and you add some capabilities out of loop of provisioning, we can do a policy check, so checking the SOD policies before that can even happen to the privileged account management system if it's being utilized directly outside of the uh, provisioning practices, uh, it'll have that policy check. Uh, and so that's a future thing we're investigating as well. And so that with that, um, I wanted to give you that uh, that overview of the Privileged Account Management Module, how it's advancing our capability to integrate with these PAM solutions and extend the user interface of Identity IQ into these containers. Uh, I want to be able to turn it over to Frank uh, Bregulio now to take us through a demonstration. Before we do, he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, what he's going to show you. So Frank, why don't you give us a bit of an overview of what you're going to show us here on this slide. Thank you, Joe, and good afternoon. Today I'm going to demonstrate some of the key features available with the Privileged Account Module available in Identity IQ. Um, I'll be showing how you can enable a 300-degree view uh, of privileged users, some lifecycle management, and governance features as well. We'll be demonstrating, um, you know, who got access to what, how they got that access, uh, that full view, 
and we'll talk about, you know, the uh, governance process and how privileged accounts uh, can be part of that, as, as Jill mentioned before. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the demonstration. Um, this scenario is our user, Frank McCarthy, has joined the regional IT operations team. He's been granted some key uh, entitlements based on based on birthright provisioning, and he needs access to the PUM tool. His manager, Amanda Ross, uh, is going to go in and provide him access. So she's going to go in and request access to the tool uh, through the entitlement catalog. I'm going to go ahead and do a search for the privilege to management tool, apply my filter, and we're going to select basic TAM access, and we'll give him Windows admins just to get started with his job. She'll go ahead and review the request. Now, one of the things that's important here is she can give him temporal assignment or, or time-based assignment to uh, the PAM tool, so we can set that for the weekend or uh, maybe uh, have it start um, a month from now, have it end a month from now. We can also submit some comments with that. So we kick off the request, and what's happening at that request, um, since I'm using the, the native provisioning uh, workflows, a policy check could have been done there. Did Frank complete his uh, cyber awareness training, um, that may be a, a vaulting thing. Did he, is he a CISSP? That may be a question. Is he in a toxic role? Um, so all those things could be checked at that, at that point. So Amanda just doesn't have the only authority to grant Frank the access. Justin Time is our system security manager, and he's required to perform the approval of the access. So he would have got a notification. He'll come in, and he's going to review that request and approve it. If there was any type of violation, um, any type of, uh, you know, that temporary membership, he'd see that all here. But we're just going to do a simple approve of both actions and complete. So if we go in now and look at the, the PAM module itself, we'll see, we'll look at the Windows admin accounts. These are the, all the containers that I have in my demo application. Um, here's the Windows account uh, container. We see the total identities, the groups and privilege items that are in the container. So we see direct access, Frank was not added. But if we look at effective access, we see Frank McCarthy has been granted access to the Windows Admin container. Now, on his account on the PUM tool, we can look at the permissions he's been granted. So we see he was granted the permissions um, from the Windows Admin group. So, in time, Frank may be assigned somewhere else. Uh, he's been assigned to the Unix admin team. And he's required access to the PUM tool. The leader of the Unix admin team can actually give him access himself um, to get this process moving a little more quickly. So he sees that he doesn't have an access via direct access. He sees there's no effective access. So he'll go in and add the access himself. So he'll search for the account he's adding. 
One of the things he also noticed there that he definitely has an account on the Palm tool. So if he didn't have an account, he wouldn't be able to provision it. So here I can select individual entitlements and we'll just give him a couple. We'll go ahead and submit. Now we kicked off that request and in my environment, managers have to approve access. So Jerry Bennett, who's the team lead, can request it, but we're gonna have Amanda go ahead and make that approval for the access. So we see she has an approval, same thing as we went before. and that kicked off that provisioning process. So if we go back in now as Justin, we'll see that Frank was added to the admins group. And one of the things that is important um, to point out here is that our groups can have separate permissions. We see here there's only one group. Uh, so they have a list of permissions that have been granted to that group. Um, what I can do is I can assign separate sets of permissions on different groups. And we'll take a look at that in a second. We see Frank was um, assigned the permissions that we've granted him. So he can go in and, and grab that password out of the PUM tool and perform his duties. One of the things uh, that I just mentioned about the group permissions, uh, this just happens to be Oracle Database Admin Access. An Oracle DBA has rights to everything. So if you're in that group, you're gonna have access to all of the permissions on the Oracle database server. Database operators shouldn't have as many permissions. So if you're included in that group, you're only gonna have a subset of those permissions. So now that we've provisioned uh, the necessary accounts, um, time passes on, and we get into, um, you know, this 30, 60 day, 90, um, 90 day recertification processes. And as Joe mentioned, that is a very key point in compliance for, um, for organizations. So we can go back in and use the native tools that we have in Identity IQ for creating a certification campaign. Um, we can use our advanced analytics to determine who has access to what, um, create the necessary reports, export this data if we need to. And we really, um, at that point, you know, have fully provided an identity governance solution to um, our customers with privileged account governance. Um, and Joe's gonna wrap us up. Thanks, Frank. So in summary, right, we see the opportunity to take these intersecting best practices and, and leverage an integrated approach to identity governance administration and privileged account management. This new PAM module for Identity IQ really enhances the data flow and adds container management, extends the Identity IQ user interface to go beyond just the ability to look at individual user identity cubes with the privileged account management flowing into them, but now present this container interface where we can allow admins to zoom in, zoom out on how containers of privileged access uh, are being administered and being provisioned to individual users. Frank showed you the direct and effective access, which aids in the ability to see that uh, clearly. Of course, all this information is flowing back into our standard operating procedures on lifecycle management and uh, ongoing certification campaigns. 
We are partnering with really all the PAM leaders. Um, you should check. Uh, Mayor Goldberg runs the Identity Plus Alliance, and so at any time you can check the status of your particular PAM vendor. Uh, but our goal here is to continue to advance the state of the art in governance administration in concert with these privileged account management s solutions that are providing those deeper controls for those privileged accounts. And, um, and so with that, we'd love to continue to hear your feedback on the solution itself and uh, individual partnerships and the needs that you have. Uh, with that, why don't we turn it over to Shay to give us some questions. Thank you, Joe. Okay, we will answer as many as we can get to in the time allotted. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So our first question, how will these IGA plus PAM solutions be supported? Uh, good question. So the, um, whenever you have multiple vendors uh, getting involved in a combined solution offering and uh, needing to support that, you know, the usual rules apply. We each will be supporting our aspects of the solution. However, as partners, you know, our goal is to work with our customers and make them successful with this combination. And so, as, as an example, in the Identity Plus Alliance, we have a, a tech lead, David Lee, who is really responsible for orchestrating that cross-product support experience uh, by making sure we involve uh, the PAM partner when we receive a call about a solution uh, I issue that's either in the PAM module or in Identity IQ um, that might involve a, the, a particular context for the individual PAM vendor. So we orchestrate that cross-product support so that you, the end user, our customer, you know, has success with pulling these two technologies together. The PAM module, of course, is a sale point offering, so th th that's where we've sort of stepped up uh, as an extension of Identity IQ. We've added, you know, added that product. Obviously, we support that product through and through, uh, but in the con context of these uh, integrated solutions that we've we've certified with our partners, uh, that's a key part of the, the the value proposition to you, our customer. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Is the PAM module a sale point module or a PAM vendor module? Or is there a module from both which sync together? Who do we contract with for purchase, maintenance, licensing, et cetera? Licensing, et cetera. Good question. So the PAM module is a sale point product offering. It is an add-on to Identity IQ, which we sell separately. Uh, and therefore, it, it has, a, you know, it's part of a contract for Identity IQ and we support it and there's maintenance for the PAM module. The, um, where we are today with our PAM partners is they have yet, they're all, they're all starting to work with the new APIs presented by the PAM module to rev their integrations with us, with, with us which we will certify. And so that involves the, whatever versions they include their new updated integrations w within, you'd want to make sure that you implemented that version of their software to take advantage of any net new functionality that could be enabled with the PAM module. However, an important thing for me to state is that the PAM module works with the existing integrations because there's already an established data flow and so you can benefit from aspects of this visibility with the PAM module utilizing the data flow that's already enabled via the certified integrations using the previous method, which was this simple table integration method. It's the, some of the more advanced features and functions and use of, uh, of a more enriched data flow that the PAM solution vendors will incorporate into their next version, which we'll also certify and be very specific about. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is a question about the demo. It says, when the access request was performed, was that request going through Active Directory groups or direct provisioning to the PAM container? Uh, the demonstration is configured with a sample PAM application that was uh, – so the, the groups were aggregated as entitlements. Uh, from the PAM application. Uh, so that was going um, directly to the PAM container. Great. Okay. Um, can you turn off the ability to allow people to view passwords, example, disable that functionality entirely in the implementation? Uh, yes. 
those permissions were aggregated from the the privileged account management module um, the application and those are container permissions group permissions so whatever you're allowing um, if you're not allowing view password or use password on a specific group then those entitlements wouldn't show up okay Okay, next question. If we implement the new containerized PAM module, will we need to upgrade our current Identity IQ implementation to the containerized module model? Uh, that's the, an Identity IQ version support question, right? So with 7.2, isn't that right, Frank? Yes, yes. The, the PAM module is available in 7.1 P2. Okay. Okay, we have one more question that we have time for and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Can you use the PAM module to provision system process accounts that are used by business applications to connect to, say, databases? Those system accounts are owned by applications and not used interactively. That's a good question. And if they are... PAM mod or in the PAM tool, then, then, then yes, uh, we could provision just like I did with direct access. Uh, that is how you'd achieve that. Okay. Okay, one more and then we're done. <laughs> Does SailPoint have a recommended approach for provisioning to PAM systems or other systems where a direct connector may exist? For example, should we provision direct to the system or indirect via Active Directory groups? I think that would be an organizational preference because it can be done either way. Uh, we, can, we can integrate via Active Directory group, um, understanding that those groups are used today uh, to uh, probably provide the access control to, to the uh, entitlement. Um, but also when we, we do this integration with the PAM module, uh, we're gonna be importing those as entitlements as well. So, that would be, you know, one of those things that um, would be organizational and implementation specific. And it actually Got varies it. with the PAM vendor. So they have their different facilities for handling both direct and, and AD group based uh, container uh, uh, enablement. And so you'd want to examine how you're implementing with that PAM vendor. Uh, in the context of what Frank mentioned, your organizational approach, which then we would want to dovetail with your governance approach. And so, you know, in the end, uh, I best practice is often utilizing the groups that SailPoint is governing and controlling and that are also being used, as Frank mentioned, for access control. So you get a sort of double utility out of the groups, but you're controlling those groups via your, your, uh, your governance models and your policies and your provisioning. Good points, Joe. Got it. Great, thank you. Okay, that is all the time we have for questions today. Um, keep an eye out for an email from us tomorrow, including a recording of today's presentation. If you'd like to learn more, you can contact us at sales at salepoint.com or at the number on your screen. Um, in addition to that recording tomorrow, you will be receiving a solution brief that kind of elaborates more if you want to dig in deeper on what was discussed today. Joe, Frank, thank you both for presenting today. Thank you to everyone who joined us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.